TB. We used to diagnose TB as uh, fever, cough, cox contact, TB contact, and mantu positive, and we used to uh, make it a diagnosis of TB. But now we have a microbiological diagnosis, and what I need to really emphasize is that please go in for microbiological diagnosis of TB because it can be a great imitator and it can mimic various kinds of infections, malignancies, autoimmune disorders. And the mimics can depend whether they are pulmonary or extra pulmonary. So I will be discussing these mimics with a little few cases also that we have reported in the past. Next slide. So if you get a patient with lymph nodes, just because there are lymph nodes, say cervical lymph nodes, don't think this could be TB, it could be lymphoma, it could be carcinoma, it could be sarcoid. Sometimes a history of cat exposure you have to ask because cat scratch disease can come like this. And nowadays we are seeing a lot of non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So whenever you have a child who comes with a unilateral node, especially in the posterior triangle, think of TB. But if you have a unilateral anterior triangle, think of NTMs. And do ask for history of exposure to pigeons and ask for history of exposure to putting the hand into some gutter water or some pond that can also cause these kind of NTM lymphadenitis. Next slide. Now I'll just give you an example. We had this 20-month-old uh, boy who presented from Nepal. He had fever, cough, weight loss and uh, x-ray which shows, you can see the x-ray which showing a left upper zone patch. And there was no improvement in spite of being on anti-TB drugs from Nepal for one and a half month. He was started because the uh, aunt had pulmonary TB, she was AFB positive, she was on anti-TB treatment for a month and a half, the child's mantu was positive. But on these circumstantial evidences, this child was started on first line, but there was no improvement and then was referred to us. So what we thought is we'll get a CT guided biopsy. We did a CT guided biopsy and you can see this uh, histopath slide, you can see a kind of a parasite with some wings and that parasite is actually a lung fluke so you can get and then when we back went back into the history there was a history of exposure to sheep so you can get these kind of uh, mimics that are there so again emphasis is go in for a microbiological diagnosis before you say this is tb and start the patient on treatment next slide so if you get a lymph node uh, how do you differentiate TB from the other mimics? So TB lymph nodes are usually matted and they will usually be in the posterior triangle and they will have sinus tracts. Lymphoma will be rubbery and they will be bilateral uh, disease. Sarcoid again very difficult to identify from TB but sarcoid would not come only with a cervical lymph node. There will be systemic manifestations. There will be fever, there will be hepatosplenomegaly. So, and sarcoid rare in children, it's more common in the adults. If you look at NTM lymphadenopathy, it's usually unilateral anterior cervical lymph nodes, history of any exposure to birds, pigeons, or you will get history of exposure of putting the hands into the gutter water. And NTM lymphadenopathy is usually tender and they have a bluish discoloration. Cat scratch disease, it's an acute onset of lymph node. You will get a history of some cat exposure. And Bartonella Hensley serology is difficult to do, but you could always give a course of doxycycline or azithromycin and see the response. Next slide. Now, if you look at bone and joint TB mimics, uh, what we usually get osteomyelitis, the first thing that comes to your mind is, is it pyogenic or is it TB? when it's a chronic osteomyelitis. So in our country, we always keep TB also in mind. Also keep in mind brucellosis, especially if the child has come from a village or from some uh, place where he's been living in a farm. Keep in mind fungal osteomyelitis, especially if the child is immunocompromised, and then it could still be malignancy with bone metastasis. Next slide. So I'll just give you an example of this patient. We had a three-year-old girl. She had fever for seven, eight months. There was a swelling over the left cheek. The mother was diagnosed as TB lymphadenopathy and she was on anti-TB drugs for four months. Again, this child had a Mantu test done, which was positive. ESR was 90, chest x-ray was normal. And then she was referred to us for starting anti-TB treatment. We did a CT and CT showed 
chronic inflammatory destruction of the maxillary sinus and it was some sort of a mass so she underwent surgery and the histopath was suggestive of myxoma so just because there was mother having tb though it was non infective tb the child's one to was positive don't assume every swelling that you see in the body will be tb you could be missing out other things so don't again reiterating that don't jump into the bandwagon of just starting tb treatment because you had some circumstantial evidences next slide so if you look at bone and joint mimics uh, apart from tb osteomyelitis what you keep in mind is pyogenic osteomyelitis brucellosis metastasis and sarcoid now tb osteomyelitis or spondylitis usually very slow onset they usually come to you as back pain back pain back pain for a few months and then when you examine you find a gibbous uh pyogenic osteomyelitis they will start with an acute onset it's very tender they will have severe pain there will be neutrophilia high grade fever an mri can help you distinguish brucellosis again back pain but brucellosis will also come to you as pu or pyrexia of unknown origin hepatosplenomegaly and an exposure to unpasteurized dairy metastatic disease uh, apart from bone pains you will also get a primary tumor somewhere or you will get hepatosplenomegaly and as i told you previously also sarcoid is rare in children and you look for associated hepatosplenomegaly non next slide now let's talk about pulmonary tb uh, you could have pulmonary tb mimics so you could have a child being referred to you in fact two days back we had a child being referred to us as fibrocavitatory tb and if you saw the x ray of that patient he had florid uh, lesions in bilateral lung severely malnourished sam and everything fitting into tb ct scan also the radiologist reported that there are non necrotic mediastinal nodes and uh, there is lot of florid uh, nodules everywhere in the lung suggestive of tb when we did a bronchoalveolar lavage in that child the gene expert came negative what came positive was pseudomona so you could have bacterial pneumonia coming to you as tb mimic so don't again jump into that thing oh this looks like tb radiologically let me start akt ntms can come like this especially of mycobacterium avium complex can come like this fungal infections like histoplasmosis especially in we think of tb in our country in americas they would think of histoplasmosis similar picture very same to tb malignancies of the lung more in the elderly population not really what you would see in younger children sarcoid comes as a differential anywhere that you look at tb keep in mind chronic bronchitis with infections bronchiectasis with infections pulmonary infarction Uh, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis that can just mimic your uh, uh, miliary tb so a lot of differentials that you have with uh, pulmonary tb next slide now let me tell you this case this was a 9 year old girl she had left sided chest pain for 3 months fever and cough for 2 we- weeks and x ray showed a massive left sided pleural effusion so everything going towards tb pleural effusion long standing history and on tapping the pleural fluid it was found to be pus so this could also be empyema or this could be tuberculous empyema her pus culture did not grow anything tb mg culture at the end of 3 weeks grew mycobacterium species which on pcr was suspected to be ntm and then confirmed to be mycobacterium avian on sequencing so not every pleural effusion means tb it could be tb but it could be non tuberculous mycobacteria and the treatment of mycobacterium avium is very different as compared to tb you would be giving hrz for tb mycobacterium avium you would be adding a macrolide like clarithromycin or azithromycin you would prefer to give amikacin in these patients so the treatment becomes very different next slide so among your tb pulmonary mimics you have pulmonary they come to you as fever cough and weight loss pleural effusions your one is bacterial pneumonia which i told you was the first thing that about the other patient that we had two days back you could have ntm lung disease like mycobacterium avium and mycobacterium abscesses more common in patients who have an underlying immunodeficiency like cystic fibrosis or you could have it in patients like hiv 
fungal infections histoplasmosis is more common in americas but you could get it in india here and you have to keep a very strong watch for that lung cancer more common in elderly population whenever you get a history of hemoptysis keep that in mind and sarcoidosis again systemic involvement has to be there next slide now if we look at cns mimics uh tbms we usually have a child with meningitis we say it's tbm if it's a lympho predominance low sugar meningitis and a long standing history and we always call tb as tb meningoencephalitis so there is a component of meningitis as well as encephalopathy pyogenic meningitis comes just like meningitis so they will not have altered sensorium viral encephalitis will come to you as altered sensorium and tb meningoencephalitis may come to you as altered sensorium raised icit and meningeal signs other things that can mimic tb is fungal meningitis cryptococcus and brain tumors may mimic your tuberculomas and gliomas lymphomas metastases may be difficult to identify brain tumors next slide so just go back home huh? so if you have cns remember tb meningitis they come to you as focal neurological deficits basal meningeal exudates and you will get cranial nerve palsies you will have the one thing that i tell the pay, uh, students is that whenever you have tb meningitis you are always suspecting there's a hydrocephalus you won't get hydrocephalus with other things and to suspect hydrocephalus look at tendo achilles shortening so if there's shortening of the tendo achilles because once the hydrocephalus starts it starts with the lateral ventricles and your leg fibers are next to it so the first thing that gets affected is your leg fibers the pyramidal tracts and as a result of which they have shortening of the tendo achilles so if you get that sign that tells you this child has hydrocephalus and the moment you get hydrocephalus you know it's tb it cannot be viral meningitis it cannot be pyogenic meningitis and cryptococcal meningitis also doesn't come like that pyogenic meningitis you will suspect when the child comes with an acute history and csf will show neutrophils and very low sugars cryptococcal meningitis you will suspect in an immunocompromised patient hiv they come to you as just headache severe headache and the only thing that you will get in them is raised icit signs they will not have hydrocephalus they will have not have meningitis but raised icit signs and brain tumors they'll come to you as focal neurological deficits or they may come to you as partial seizures and mri and mri spectroscopy may help you to differentiate between tuberculoma and other cns uh, tumors next slide if you look at abdominal tb mimics lot of times we get patients and we are not sure whether abdominal pain iliocecal valve thickening on ultrasound or ct and we land up with a colonoscopy and colonoscopy also shows something like uh, granulomas you don't know whether it's a crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or tb then malignancies can so anything that's involving the iliocecal valve can mimic tb sarcoid can mimic tb next slide so to differentiate that uh tb and crohn's is very very difficult both can come with iliocecal valve thickening uh, crohn's disease is a little more extensive it will have skip lesions in tb and the histopath you'll see caseating granulomas whereas in crohn's it is non caseating so this is one way that you will uh, be able to differentiate lot of times we've had patients where we've started anti tb treatment gene expert negative but based on histopath and over a period of time we realized that they also have a associated crohn's and you may need to treat them simultaneously for crohn's also so keep that in mind that it it's not going to be only one you can have both the diseases is coming together malignancies older people after the age of 40 anyone uh, stool test should be a part of a regular health checkup anywhere that you have occult blood positive in stool in an older person think of malignancy and sarcoid is pretty rare next slide now if you have systemic tb so where you have fever pyrexia of unknown origin hepatosplenomegaly how do you suspect that there may be tb or something else so the most important that you keep in mind is autoimmune disorders then you keep in mind malignancies like leukemia and lymphoma and then you can have a disseminated fungal infection next slide 
So we had a 12 year old boy, he was diagnosed as AML and, and was on chemotherapy, acute myeloid leukemia. After two months, he had high grade fever, wet cough and loss of weight and appetite. And there was a history of hemoptysis present. So he was suspected to have got TB while he was on chemo. CT with an angiography was done and there was an ill-defined heterogeneous enhancing mediastinal mass in the right paratracheal region. So that mass was biopsied and there was no granuloma. It was an abscess with granulation tissue. Now from that biopsy tissue, cultures were sent, bacterial and fungal cultures were negative, gene expert was negative. Because this child was on chemo, immunosuppressed and was mimicking TB, we said this could be histoplasma. We sent a urine histoplasma antigen which was positive. And this child was treated with M4B and CT thorax after one month showed complete regression of that mass. So again, symptoms very similar to TB, radiologically very similar to TB, but what made us suspect is when TB test came negative, we thought of histoplasma. Okay, next slide. So just a key message that whenever you are treating a patient with TB, try and get a microbiological diagnosis. And try and get histopath cultures, CBNAT done so that you can avoid a mimic. We've, you've learned from our previous case where the child was given AKT for six months and a lymphoma was completely missed. And the most important is sarcoid versus TB is most difficult, challenging. ACE levels may sometimes help you, but the most important is caseating granulomas versus non-caseating granulomas for sarcoid. Okay, thank you very much.